Good afternoon and very well welcome to uh, all of you who has joined us and also a very warm, very warm welcome to the uh, my guest today. We are having a roundtable day, a slightly different format to what our audience probably has uh, been accustomed to at Bruegel. We've gathered around the table a group of uh, experts uh, and a group of Bruegel fellows who comment on the issue of ECB strategy and the review that is currently uh, ongoing. Uh, and I'm delighted to uh, welcome today to this roundtable uh, Reza Mogdaban, who is the Chief Economic Advisor at Morgan Stanley, and Eric Nielsen, who is the Group Chief Economist at Unicredit. Welcome both and also delighted to welcome Philip Lane who is the chief economist on the European Central Bank member of the board uh, to have a discussion of this. I'm also joined by the Bruegel fellows who regularly comment on these uh, uh, issues that we are engaged in a discussion on how to do this. Uh, they need no introduction but I'll introduce them anyway. Guntram Wolf, uh, Francesco Bavadia and Gregory Clays. Thank you for joining me in, uh, in discussing the very topical issue an issue that has been delayed as a result of the pandemic, but is uh, is now, I would imagine, full throttle, waiting to see how this will uh, the ECB will consider uh, reconsidering its uh, strategy, also following what we've seen uh, in the US uh, last year. Uh, let me take maybe two minutes to introduce a few bullet points, which I think uh, ought to be part of the discussion, and then uh, we can go more into details uh, as uh, the discussion unfolds. Um, I'd like to make five comments, and and I will categorize them in three groups. Uh, the first group is, uh, is, is the group of what I would not call the easy things to think about, but, but things that are perhaps very clear in terms of how to do them and what they aim to achieve when we consider the uh, review of the ECB's uh, um, uh, strategy. And that is, the first one is that the inflation target themselves itself. For the moment, we have an inflation target that is not a perfect signal. I mean, the target there is there to give a signal for expectations to coordinate, I would argue there's time to clarify this target, make it a little bit clear, make sure that there's no noise in the signal, make it effectively a focal point from close to but below 2% uh, to 2%. I think that would be a much better uh, signal. Again, I'm saying that this is a clear objective, uh, not necessarily something that can be done like this, but it's worth uh, investigating. And the second thing, and in line also what we've heard from uh, the uh, strategy review that took place in the US, where we're turning into an average uh, inflation targeted regime, it's a regime that implies symmetry, something that we don't have uh, today. Um, uh, but it also, I believe, would benefit from something else, which is explicit bands around uh, uh, this target. This is something that really the credibility and accountability of a central bank would improve if you had something that is, you know, communicable, clear and, and well understood by others. Um, now, uh, my fifth point is going to be a point about uncertainty. So I will urge a little bit of caution when we talk about bands around a given target. These bands need to be broader than otherwise, given the circumstances in which we are operating today but we will probably operate in the future are very, very uncertain. And we need broader bands because in, you know, in circumstances of uncertainty, uh, it is better to be predictable than to be precise. Um, we'll come back to this point. Then my second category, and I, it is really one point in this category, but it's a very important one, is really about the greening of monetary policy. This is the new, the new stuff that we haven't had before in the context of a central bank strategy, uh, but it's something that the ECB has taken very, very seriously. We see repeatedly uh, the issue of greening monetary policy is becoming of a prime importance in the context of running uh, uh, central banking. Um, here, I would really ask the panelists to give us their views on the issue, and in particular on how to do it, given how new uh, uh, this objective is. Of course, it is part of the secondary objectives of the ECB strategy, but you know, giving that greater priority and how to do it will be important. My third category is the difficult part, the parts that are not clear and it will be even more uh, unclear in terms of how to implement them. And I have two points here. The first one is the interest rates themselves. Uh, if you look at the path of interest rates, they have been declining for a long time. They're expected to stay very, very low uh, for a very long time, dare I say forever. Um, this is something that is a lot of ink has been spilled in terms of trying to understand why interest rates are coming down. Philip has a very nice speech on this issue, and I'm hoping that he'll be able to comment on that. But here the, the difficult part is, well, if it is really the equilibrium interest rate that is coming down, um, then the policy rate can't really deviate from it for a very long time. If it's true, 
what can really policy do? What can monetary policy do uh, to stimulate the economy? What can fiscal policy do in this respect to stimulate the economy? That's a very big theme and one that is not so clear, but is the reality in which monetary policy will have to operate uh, in the future. And here I come to my fifth point. There is conditions of fundamental uncertainty of the likes that we haven't seen in a very long time. And not just because of the pandemic, but also because of the <coughs> pandemic. You know, forget about baseline scenarios in terms of designing policy. We need to design policy for multiple scenarios, irrespective of how likely we may or may not believe uh, uh, they are. So effectively, monetary policy is all about robustness. It's not so much about the perfect design of it. Communication will have to adjust for it. I mean, you, in conditions of uncertainty, by definition, we know less, and therefore it would be important to communicate how to deal with different circumstances. You know, these are my, my points, and I'm hoping we'll be able to come back to it. Um, why don't I give the floor first to, to our external speakers? Reza, if I may ask you to start and give us your thoughts on how should the ECB be thinking about revising its monetary policy strategy? Reza. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, good to be with you. And uh, I'll touch on a few of the themes that you mentioned, given the limited time. Maybe I'll come back to some of them during the discussion, but uh, let me touch on uh, some of them. Uh, but before I start, also allow me to um, make two observations before I, I comment on some of the issues you mentioned. Uh, observation number one, inflation expectations in the, in the Eurozone now are the lowest they have ever been since the euro was established. They are lower than they were during and in the aftermath of the last uh, uh, Europe crisis, despite the fact that Europe is viewed to have had a more coherent and coordinated approach to respond in this crisis. You do not see that in the US. In the US, inflation expectations are back to pre-crisis level. In fact, they are confirming the Fed's above two uh, desire to pay inflation expectations are above two. Second observation, I think one has to accept that the ECB should not be the only game in town. Other factors matter in terms of generating growth and, and inflation. How Europe responds to the pandemic, how you uh, prevent the scarring factors from the pandemic will matter. How fiscal policy moves forward will matter. Nonetheless, I think the strategy review is an opportunity for the ECB to uh, reset and increase inflation expectations. And I'll, I'll touch on three aspects of this, three things that the current consensus that is emerging worries me. And I will, I will, because of that, I think we need to go beyond the current consensus. So number one, the choice between what you mentioned, symmetric 2% target and average inflation targeting. I would argue that it is given the constraint that the ECB faces in raising inflation expectations, the 2% symmetric target is simply not sufficient. You need to go beyond that and commit to raising interest rates, sorry, raising inflation rates above the 2%. Now, this is, this is controversial in Europe. It wasn't so controversial in the US, but it is controversial in Europe. But let me just go through some of the controversy and, and try and uh, argue against. So people uh, object to average inflation targeting because they say, well, there are structural factors in Europe. There is technology, there is uh, the, the, the demographics. These push inflation down. So it's futile to commit to higher than 2% inflation. I would argue that while these are true, structural factors push inflation down, there is nothing structural about inflation itself. There is no natural rate of inflation. And like the US, Europe needs some inflation in order to counter wage and price rigidities 
and even more so than the US because these wage and price rigidities are unequal in the 19 countries of the Eurozone. And therefore, uh, if you do not have a, an adequate level of inflation, you will force internal uh, competitiveness adjustments in countries and would, would have higher, uh, bigger recessions than you would otherwise have. So particular factors, but I think I uh, think this objection is not correct. There are, there are other objections, I can come back to it. People argue that in, uh, in the average inflation targeting framework, bygones are not bygones. And therefore, while you will have above target inflation and looser policy, you will have to go below target at some stage and tighter policies as you would otherwise have. But I think that's not a problem without a solution. The Fed itself is calling its framework as average, flexible average inflation targeting. So you do not, you can introduce some flexibility in the same way that ECB and others have introduced flexibility when it comes to inflation targeting itself. We have moved from inflation targeting to, to flexible inflation targeting. And finally, and importantly, people say, well, it's not credible. It's not credible for the ECB to promise uh, that it would, it would have above 2% inflation because it has, it has not had it for the last 10 years. So if you cannot reach 2%, how can you be credible? Now, the purpose of the strategy review itself is to have that commitment in order not to shy away later from the measures that you need to take in order to get there. So the fact that you haven't had, had it in the past doesn't argue that it should not like, commit to going there in the future and thereby changing inflation expectations. So in short, I would argue that Europe should, be, should consider average inflation targeting or at least a mechanism that allows it to commit to overshooting the target for a period of time. Uh, briefly on a couple of other issues, instruments. I think um, the ECB has done an excellent job over time in uh, adapting its toolkit. The PEP and the jewel rates are the latest uh, episode of that. I fear, my worry is, as you go beyond the current pandemic crisis, and especially as you go beyond application of PEP, the current tools for unconventional and conventional, I'll come to that, are not adequate to be able to credibly deliver 2% or 2% plus uh, inflation. What can the ECB do? The three very, uh, very quick thoughts. One, I think the ECB could and, uh, probably should commit to purchasing, uh, potentially purchasing assets it has not done in the past, private assets, for example. Doesn't necessarily mean that you will go there, but the strategy review is an opportunity to say that if the need arises, we can buy ETFs, we can buy bank mortgages, we can buy bank debt, issues that have been taboo so far, but the strategy review at least allows you to put it on the table. Um, secondly, I think we need a better solution to the zero lower bound. I think ECB has been uh, creative here with the introduction of the dual rates and they, they are very helpful and they probably will stay part of the toolkit, but can one go further? And I think the introduction of digital euro does create that possibility that as cash is diminished, the, the flight to cash problem with going uh, uh, below uh, the negative uh, zero lower bound, and it, it allows you to go even lower than the current reversal rate. So I think I would encourage ECB developing the digital euro they seem to be uh, doing some work on that. I think that will help. Financial markets are skeptical, but the central bank has to have the means of doing so if the need arises. And finally, on the, on the tools, I would say there is huge skepticism in Europe about yield curve control. 
understandably so, because you have 19 different yield curves. But I, I urge putting that also on the table. One, the experience in Japan has not been bad, it's been good. Secondly, you will have a liquid uh, asset which will create a euro yield curve very soon. And so you could have a system where you can have, you can control the yields in the Eurozone around that new Euro yield curve. Complicated, <clears throat> but I wouldn't rule it out. Uh, finally, uh, let me turn to one of the issues you mentioned, Maria, the uh, green. Now, the, 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 the role of the ECB, which is part of the, uh, part of the strategy review, um, there is an emerging consensus, which I, again, I think does not go far enough. And that emerging consensus is it is the job of the central bank, including the supervisors, to produce, to, in, uh, to make sure there is maximum transparency on the impact of, on uh, the climate uh, change aspects of underlying assets, the impact on climate change of underlying assets. So transparency um, and essentially uh, classification of assets on their in terms of their impact on uh, uh, on climate change from green to brown to black etc. I don't think this goes far enough. Why? We, we have speech after speech by central bankers telling us there is a market failure. You cannot say, well, there is a market failure but we only ask for transparency and we keep our policies neutral. I think you need to go further. And I think uh, ECB can do that in its collateral policy and potentially in its monetary policy operations like the reinvestment strategy. And I think it does provide a vehicle for coordination where with fiscal policy totally within remit uh, and the mandate of the ECB, given the strong support for uh, green initiatives in Europe. So thank you. I'll stop there and I'll come back to some thank of Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, that's great. Thank you very much. Professor. There's lots of things, including the digital euro, which I'm sure Gregory would comment on. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you will, but uh, thank you for bringing that up also. And also a very big thing that uh, you know, maybe we want to consider. So, uh, uh, Eric, do you do you agree with with Reza that you know uh, we can bring inflation back to two percent? Yep. Hi. Uh, I was unmuting myself. I saw the operator had muted me, just just like my wife usually does. So I <laughs> I, I muted myself back again. Uh, so thanks for that. Thanks for having me. Uh, it all super interesting stuff. Um, let me let me start by saying that I I like to speak for a few minutes if we have time. Um, the, the first thing is I agree with very much what Reza has just said. Uh, I agree with the issue of yield curve control de facto. I'll come back to that in a little bit. Uh, I Obviously, I would say I agree with what he said on climate change issues. Uh, I would say, though, that I wish the fiscal and political authorities would take more of a leading role. It's a, so we know better what it is that we price in terms of financial stability and, and relative prices, because we are still, for example, give you an obvious case, there's all the talk about carbon taxation and stuff, which I hope we will get to. But until we get a clearer political direction, uh, I, I, um, I think it's difficult to really put one head around all the issues with regard to monetary policy, but I, but I am very supportive and obviously I hope we all uh, we'll do what we have to do uh, for on the climate change side of it. Now, uh, three things that I, I that Risa said that I'm a little bit more worried about. Uh, number one, uh, I'm a little bit less convinced about the issue of inflation target creating the right inflation expectations and what it then leads to. Uh, I. I, uh, I, if I understood you right, Risa, you, you have quite a bit of, of confidence that if one says it, uh, but I couldn't quite understand if you, how much you, how far you went down the line of also saying the central bank needs to show the instruments that will make it happen. Uh, 
So that is one issue, and specifically that led you to talk about the uh, flexible target at the Fed. I'm a bit more skeptical on that. Let's see what the jury for me is still out. Uh, uh, flexible average inflation targeting, I think we will have a big difficulty understanding where the base is from what we do. So what are they actually targeting down the line? And then finally, uh, on digital currency, I have to say, I'm a big skeptical, a skeptic. Uh, I, I, I am familiar with the uh, papers from the ECB, obviously, and we have also from, from Munich Credit commented on them. My view is that at least I have not really understood how the well-known issues with digital currencies uh, towards the banking system, for example, even you have a dual system, how that is being addressed uh, and would be addressed um, and to do this, just to be able to drive negative rates to minus 10 or whatever you want, I, mean, I, I worry a bit. I, for me, I'm skeptical until I'm, I'm persuaded otherwise. But let me now say just two or three things uh, specifically now on that I had thought carefully about before today's session on the review specifically. So I think the first thing I'd say is that it's important, I think, for the ECB to become clearer in its acceptance that, uh, saying the obvious, that, that inflation has been undershot for many, many years. Um, and, and the forecasts keep on saying we're coming back. And that's not a criticism of the ECB's forecasting. We have all been, at least me included, have been wrong on this. So I think we have come to, I, I think the Goodhart book from last year is persuasive to a large extent that big structural issues have been in play and may have been more helpful to the period where inflation was being hit uh, quite precisely. Uh, and now we lost it. And maybe it comes back again, right? That along with the whole issue that, for example, is being featured a lot by the IIF in Washington on the whole output gap story, I think there is something to be said there, of course, interlinked, that, uh, that maybe the output gap has just been bigger than we thought uh, and still is, and we don't really get this. But the bottom line of this is inflation has been undershot for many years, and I think it's very important to accept that this has been damaging to the economy. Uh, too low inflation is not good uh, because primarily it delays the necessary relative price changes for a dynamic economy, particularly on the weight side because you have the problem on the negative side, obviously. But also if you shoot very close to zero and given the normal variety, you hit the zero bound too often. And I would rather deal with that with trying to drive inflation a bit higher than open up the possibility of going deeply negative. Um, so the first thing is I think one has to sort of, of be clear on this and then either persuade us with a review that now we get it, now we understand, and it was just 20 years or 10 years of, of stuff we didn't understand, but now we got it and, and persuade us. I think the hill is steep to climb on that one. Um, so, uh, so, and I don't think personally that the Fed really has done the right thing or have come clean enough in that sense. Um, then let me lead to what I think maybe one should consider. Uh, and I admittedly maybe be more provocative or radical than is realistic. Uh, the first thing I want to say, though, is that I think the present ECB policy, particularly during the pandemic, has been absolutely first class. I, uh, I, I know they don't like to say that it's youth could control de facto, but articulated, I think, brilliantly and, and very persuasively by Philip in his blog back in March, uh, and including that it applies to all constituencies of the, of the ECB, I think, was just about the best communication and clearest we in the market could have wished for. And, and I think this is a, it's outstanding and, and, and really, really very, very good. But there is a day, of course, where another regime has to step in. And I'm a little bit worried about when that is and how it's defined. There's a lot of talk about when GDP come back to pre-pandemic levels, but I think we should hope that the ambition is higher uh, than just get to that level. Maybe it's not the continuation of the trend line because maybe we have killed some potential output. Hopefully we build some also with the green packages and climate policies and all the rest of it. But that's a discussion one can have uh, uh, down the line. But for the review, I would suggest, uh, and 
going a bit radical now, acknowledging that inflation targeting may not has be, have may have been benefiting for some years, the first decade or, or decade and a half from luck, also from from globalization and 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 big structural forces. That luck ran out, and we don't quite know how to get it back. Uh, the present policy, where monetary policy is play, playing second role or second fiddle to fiscal policy, I think is the right th uh, thing to do now. And maybe say for the next, for example, five years, we will stay that course. Com number one, encourage, make clear that the power of monetary policy to drive up inflation is not really there given the cost that's associated with further easing. So your lack of a better word, you're running out of ammunition, reusable ammunition in a sense. And therefore, be, and you have been clear at the ECB uh, of calling for more fiscal, more of the same, and then commit to playing that role to, to facilitate it by keeping the curves and under control, as Bitson Razor said, until some sort of a measure of output gap closing, whether you do this by core inflation over a period of time or some other setting, and this can be debated how one identifies that enough is enough, but saying, but one could say that until we get core inflation, for example, at 2% or plus 2 or 3% for year, two years, on average type of thing over that time, we are completely behind the fiscal hope that we do what it takes to, to get the output gap closed and inflation up. And then, of course, you have to find a way back. Uh, and it's uh, and for example, one could say we will review this out in five years, but have an, an escape clause. Should there be financial instability? Should there be inflation accelerating too fast, or something? Then you put the plug on it and and uh, and make clear. And I emphasize this from people I talk to in the market. There's an awful, enormous number of people who think that the ECB sort of can't exit that it's going to be too bumpy. I don't agree with it. I think Bill Berti wrote a very nice piece not long ago last week that basically said, you know, tapering will happen. Yeah, it may be bumpy, but you try, we'll try to explain it. And I think the ECB has a, as good a chance as anybody else to explain and, and guide the market through it. But, but what I'm saying as a bottom line here is, I think with the review, uh, the danger is, and I'm looking at the Fed in this context in my assessment, the danger is that one comes out with something that resembles fine tuning of definition of the target and we could do a little bit more thing. Then I am afraid that credibility could be eroded. Uh, and I would think that it's worth considering radical measures uh, because the damage is, is, is visible, I believe, of too low inflation for too long. Um, mm. I'll leave it like this, thanks. Thank you, Eric. But I mean, you know, it would be important to understand what is it that we didn't know in the past 20 years that we will know for the next 20 years, and therefore we can focus better. And, you know, I would, I would like us to sort of think about this, because if it is the equilibrium that is coming down, why is it coming down? And, you know, if you accept that, and I don't know that you do, but if you were to accept that, um, you know, what can policy, modern monetary policy really do? And here, you know, you bring in the fiscal policy as the other side of the macro management. Uh, but, you know, if we were, there is also this problem that if we do more of this fiscal policy, and I'm being contrarian here by purpose, um, interest rate will necessarily have to come up. That is going to create a sort of other problems at the sustainability level or not. Um, so, you know, you know, the consistency of the macro management is something, of course, that's not part of the ECB strategy review. Uh, uh, but in terms of recommending what can we do better to bring inflation up, to remove the distortionary components that you described, and yet again, not jeopardize the other side of macro management, which is the fiscal, the sustainability of the fiscal side. Um, but, you know, can I bring my colleagues into the discussion? I'm sure they have a lot of comment on, on, on what you just said. Um, uh, Guntram, would you like to go first? And I know that you care deeply also about the greening of, of monetary policy. So, you know, if you have something to say there, uh, I would be I would be really interested to hear what that is. Well, uh, thanks, Maria. I, I didn't really uh, want to talk about the greening, but okay, well. <laughs> but, but look, I, I, I and you know, I'm I'm more in a commenting mode, so I, I didn't oh. hear a long, very long speech. But but let me just make make three quick points. I mean, I think the first point that I think. The ECB really needs to ask very frankly and openly um, in that in that review is, you know, has it lost uh, the capacity to actually bring back inflation to where it was? Um, uh, because it seems to me all these um, 
forecasts that have been missed uh, really um, have put a dent on uh, on the credibility um, uh, of the ECB in, in doing so, uh, at least at the moment. Um, I think the, the second issue and there, I'm, I'm quite quite close to, to Eric, um, that, that I think really deserves quite a bit of discussion, is, is the fiscal uh, monetary policy, uh, policy interaction cooperation. And, you know, I think the, the, yield, the yield curve uh, control issue, um, Eric, that you mentioned, I think it's, 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 it's very important. And it's very important that in the current situation, um, member states, because they are the fiscal actors, the EU um, uh, next generation EU uh, thing is is actually, uh, as you know, it's it's not even operational and it's a small thing, right? Uh, compared to what the national fiscal authorities are doing. So, so the key here is really to have national fiscal authorities in the game, being able and capable of. Um, uh, you know, doing uh, cyclical stabilization and supporting the economy and not being afraid of, um, you know, doing, doing too much. I think in the current situation, they really need to do something and they really need to do a lot. And I think we need to review uh, from an EU perspective um, whether or not um, our fiscal stance, our Eurozone fiscal stance, um, at the moment is appropriate or not. And uh, I mean, I, I was in a few internal meetings with a few uh, a few people and I was sort of a bit surprised that um, that debate isn't a bit, um, uh, let's say more, more vocal and more clear um, because, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, our fiscal policy is very supportive, but is it um, enough to really, um, uh, bring back um, our economy to where it should be. So, so really, it, it is the ECB that um, provides the um, sort of the, the the good funding conditions um, so that governments can do um, their fiscal response. But if governments are worried about um, you know what's going to happen um, in I don't know 22 when when gradually. Um, monetary policy uh, normalizes, um, then they might be overly cautious. And so, so I think that's, that's a key issue that one has to address. And it seems to me this policy coordination issue uh, needs to be a core and center of the debate um, and it needs to be core and center of the debate um, uh, in the Eurogroup in particular. Um, the, the, third, the third point, which is a more of a question, which I, I think needs to be on the table also is that we know that uh, there are distributional effects <coughs> of, of monetary policy. Um, now, there's lots of debates how those distributional effects look like and who gets affected how much and what, have, what would have been the counterfactual. But I mean, the issue of um, the, um, uh, fact, uh, the fact that stock markets um, are at all time high, all time high, and that uh, essentially the ownership of stocks um, is concentrated in the top 10%, if not the top 5%, um, is something that, that matters um, for society. And it matters um, also for then the distribution of purchasing power. And so, so thinking a little bit more about these distributional issues and what they mean for the effectiveness of monetary policy, um, I think is, is quite, quite important. And I, I was also struck, I mean, there's some research now that suggests that, um, you know, uh, if rates remain uh, too low for too long, and here you see I'm raising an issue, it's in the other direction, if rates are too low for too long, that then actually there might be um, effects on, um, on productivity because, um, because firms, um, uh, are kept alive for too long. And that is a very, very difficult debate. And I think really it's a debate where we need more research. And um, you know, I'm not saying we should withdraw earlier. You saw my, uh, my first point uh, was, well, we actually need that kind of yield curve control so that fiscal policy can do its job. But I do think we need to do the, the research and the research open-mindedly about what are the effects on productivity of, of, of that kind of monetary policy. So these are more questions that I, I want to raise um, uh, rather than sort of strong statements. But I do think these, these uh, considerations need to be part of the uh, overall debate. Thank you, Gunther, and for, for raising issues of the, the distribution element is a very important one for our policy, not just monetary policy. And of course, an important dimension that we often forget 
the policy coordination and financial fragmentation effectively, because you didn't use the term, but this is what you're talking about, the financial fragmentation in Europe, of course, is specific to the euro area, is different in other countries where you have one, one fiscal policy, one monetary policy. Here you have the added, added complication of many fiscal policies, one monetary policy and financial fragmentation on top of that. Um, uh, for, I see Francesco has his hand raised. Francesco. Well, yes, I, I, I just wanted to react to a, a common point that, that you introduced, uh, Maria, then uh, Reza and Eric. Um, so the review uh, has two big issues. One is the review of the target. The other is to find tools to reach the target. Hmm. Um, and I must say, I fail to be excited about the first one, about the review of the target. Uh, my, I, I share uh, more the skeptical view of Eric uh, uh, here. And I think that the experience of the Fed uh, with the average inflation targeting uh, is not so um, uh, enthusiastic that I would uh, I would follow it. Maybe because of uh, uh, professional bias, I'm more interested in the operational tools to reach the target. Um, but the problem here is uh, that uh, I don't think that uh, those uh, that uh, were mentioned uh, by Reza, uh, buy new assets, uh, um, uh, go digital, um, yield curve control are sufficient. Um, I, I, I don't think that they would be decisive uh, in order to uh, uh, allow the uh, ECB to reach back uh, to its, uh, uh, its target. And here I take up uh, something that Reza um, uh, sort of stressed, expectations. Um, regaining expectations is the uh, essence of regaining uh, inflation. Uh, and here, I mean, I will try again. I mean, I've been trying for the last five years uh, to put forward the idea that um, the ECB can reassure people uh, about expectations by means of intervening in the market uh, for inflation derivatives. So either inflation swaps uh, or uh, inflation options uh, to uh, tell to people, uh, listen, if I fail to reach my target, I will pay you. Uh, and this should uh, work uh, to um, help people uh, reach back to 2%. And, and here, my, my little story uh, is uh, that there is an entrepreneur uh, who has an HR uh, uh, person who has studied a lot of um, efficiency uh, wages uh, literature. And he goes uh, to the entrepreneur and says, if you give uh, high wages, uh, high wage increases, uh, your uh, workforce will become more productive. Uh, but then the entrepreneur consults uh, his uh, financial officer and he says, ah, 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 but what happens if you give high salary increases and then inflation is very low, meaning that you're squeezed between the price of what you sell and, 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 and your costs. Uh, and then uh, another uh, person comes, oh, no, 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 I have a problem. Uh, you can go and buy uh, insurance, uh, inflation insurance uh, from the ECB if indeed they don't manage uh, to push inflation where they said that they should push it, uh, they, they will pay you. And, and this will uh, get out of your uh, squeezing uh, between costs uh, and, uh, uh, and prices. Um, or the ECB could come up with some other clever idea, uh, but I think they have to think of something new. Uh, and even the, the, the new things or the newish thing uh, that uh, Reza mentioned uh, are, not, uh, are not enough. I don't touch about the monetary uh, uh, fiscal coordination, which is a big issue, but it's not the one I want to concentrate upon now. Thank you. Thanks, Francesco. Indeed, if the challenges are big and new, we need to think out of the box, right? Um, Gregory, why don't you come in? Eh? Because I'm aware of the time. No, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I wanted to re react very quick, quickly to what um, Reza has been doing and also what Francesco just said. On the first, on the average inflation targeting, you know, I, I'm I'm quite a fan of it. I don't think it it's it's major and it will change everything. But you know, uh, with Maria, we wrote about this as early as 2018. And now it's fashionable because the Fed is doing it. But but I still I still um, I still think it, it can be useful. As Maria said at the beginning, it it's useful because it makes 
really the, the target symmetric. And I think that's very important because uh, even though the ECB has been try, uh, trying to be reassuring about the symmetry for years now, there are still some doubts sometimes, especially when, uh, when we enter a crisis, as Reza showed, uh, as Reza said, um, every time there is a crisis <coughs> in Europe, expectation fall. So I think symmetry is, is crucial. I also think uh, average inflation targeting can help uh, to prevent uh, too quick uh, reversal and mistake like the ones that we have seen in Europe in 2011. So I think it's useful. I also think that uh, in, in theory, um, the, the effect on inflation expectation is seducing. We don't know if in practice it works, but, but the theoretical effects that average, in, average inflation targeting can bring uh, is, uh, is interesting. So it remains to be seen if in, pr if in practice it, it works. But, um, but, but I think it, it can still be useful. So basically, I, I would come up with um, what, what Francesco was saying about the tool uh, in a way. I think basically for average inflation targeting to work, basically first, uh, the ECB need to, to, to prove uh, that it can reach uh, 2% and that it's ready to sometimes overshoot the target. Uh, and, and to do that, basically, it will have uh, to use forcefully uh, its tools. And that's where uh, the tools are very important. Uh, and I think there we still have a problem because uh, in Europe, uh, we still don't have a clear consensus on what tool can be used, what, what the ECB wants to use, and what, what tools are also legal. Uh, there are some doubt about the legality of some tool as the um, uh, ruling of the, of the German um, uh, con uh, constitutional court uh, showed uh, in, in April. Was it in April or May? So, so I think uh, the, the ECB uh, strategy review should reflect on that. And there should be a clear consensus on what tools can be used on a permanent basis. At some point, we need to stop calling uh, balance sheet tool and asset purchase uh, unconventional. If in the end, uh, our star is really low and we are in a st secular stagnation, in the end, QE will be the, the, the main tool. So we need to think about uh, making it conventional. And also, we need this needs to be reflected also in in, for instance, in the European Court of Justice uh, ruling, because uh, in 2018, uh, the European Court of Justice ruling was saying that QE was uh, acceptable and compatible with the treaty, but only if it was limited and temporary. But, but if, if QE becomes the main tool, it cannot be temporary and, 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 um, and, and limited. So we need to think about that. I think those are, are the main problem, ma making those tools uh, really uh, permanent. Thanks very much, Gregory. Um, I'd like to bring in Philip in a minute, who can give us his reaction to all these uh, thoughts. But can I ha can I ask Eric and and uh, Reza for final thoughts on on what you've heard? If you wanted to add anything, Eric. Yeah, sure. So I mean, very quickly, let me. I I, I make two or three comments. Uh, one, what on what you said, Maria, but also in that con combination with what Gregory just said. And, and if I heard you right, Greg, then you're saying that ECB needs to be able to show it can reach the target. I think, and that I, I link up to what you, Maria, said, that we, that, that we have to understand fundamentally what drives inflation and why it's, it, we haven't got up there. I have become, I have changed my mind over time. I have come to believe that we fundamentally have overestimated the power of monetary policy for a very long time. It's possible that Goodhart's book overdoes completely the generational story but the structural stuff is important. And at the end of the day, as I think Risa also said, inflation is, I say without other words, is a function of output gaps. Right? At the end of the day, demand supply. This is sort of the story. And, and I think we have to understand this and monetary policy just can't do it alone. I mean, I, we have come to understand this and the fiscal has to be engaged. And that then leads me to the one other question I have, or point I have of what Gunshot said, and I completely agree with him. We haven't talked about distributional effects, but one reason why we haven't been able to reach the inflation in the last 10 years is that we have, for reasons we can debate, decided that fiscal consolidation, austerity, whatever you call it, after the financial crisis was what had to be done, then monetary policy get overloaded and trying to reach this elusive inflation target. And the result of that is, as Gontrop said, you get X, whatever the number percent, of all the wealth in very few hands and they cannot spend the money fast enough. This is unfair in society and it's bad economics. And therefore we have the only way of doing this is fiscal policy, of course. So we have also to try to persuade people to understand that the idea that, that public debt is something that has to be paid back. Like, I don't know what, 
or it, it, it's, it's an illusion, right? I mean, companies never pay back their debt. You need to roll it over. And then I'm not saying you can borrow forever for anything, but if you borrow and the central bank de facto buys it up, the central bank's balance sheet goes up. But the size of the balance sheet of the central bank is not a God-given number that has to be reached back to a certain level on day X. It is conditional upon the economy. So it's so so the whole game of coordination and cooperation between fiscal and monetary must be emphasized. And I, I I don't know to what extent the ECB's review can do since you're not talking about fiscal policy in the review, obviously, but you can appeal in a sense. And that's why I said early on, I I it's never nice for an institution to say, look, we just don't have the power by ourselves. Somebody has to help and we will help also. So I think this is a it's we have to get away from just thinking about monetary policy. How do we get back to the target? How do we reach the target by monetary policy? It's out of the hands in that sense. They can play a supportive role as they've done very, very well the last year or so and, and so much before, but it is, but, but, but I think this has to be the gist, I think, of the review. I think Eric, we'll make sure to invite you when we talk about fiscal policy. We can have a very passionate oh, discussion on I this. Love it. <laughs> and 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 my fellow colleagues will also have passionate discussion on this. But I, for I the get moment, a lot of hate mail. Every time I write <laughs> this in my notes, Bye. I get a lot of hate mail from certain people. I love to do it. Thank you. Ereza, your final thoughts before we uh, give uh, you very briefly. Uh, very briefly. I, I agree with much of what has been said, including on on fiscal policy and the supportive role other policies can can play. But we are talking about ECB's strategy review. And some of those issues, whether it's the stance of fiscal policy, of course, the ECB can be out there and, and uh, recommend, but it is not in ECB's control. The question is, what is in their control in the strategy review? And my fear currently is that they may disappoint. And you see that in inflation expectations. You see that in the forecast that ECB itself is making. The strategy review is an opportunity to reset that. All I'm saying is be ambitious. Do not simply settle for the consensus like symmetric inflation target. Go beyond it. I, I've had arguments uh, from European economists and central bankers against AIT. Some say it's too specific, some saying it's not specific enough. The proof is in the pudding. It has worked and, and it can be applied flexibly. I'm not saying that is the way to go, but you certainly need to go beyond symmetric inflation target. You need to go beyond the tools that are currently on the table. I like Francesca's idea, but simply intervening in the market does not increase inflation. It gives a reward who th to those who want to insure themselves against it. It doesn't by itself raise inflation expectations, but it could help. I think I am not dismissing that. And I think on fiscal policy, look for areas where you can support fiscal policy. Implicit or explicit yield curve tar targeting, forward guidance will do that. Um, having a more proactive agenda on green finance and moving away from neutrality in your operations will do that. So I stop there. Thank you, Mary. Thanks so much, Teresa. So I think, Philip, this is uh, this is uh, your uh, your time to tell us how ambitious uh, you're going to be. <laughs> Philip, please, the floor is. I think you need to unmute, Philip. You're you're muted. Uh, th thank you to everyone for all of the uh, uh, contribution. Um, maybe I'll make, I'll make a few points about, about the review. So first of all, um, just because it's 18 years since the last one, doesn't mean this strategy review necessarily has to cover eventuality for the next 18 years. Uh, there should be no kind of a belief that it, it needs to cover everything. Uh, so in other words, the strategy review has to strike a balance between moving beyond the policy challenges right now, because I mean, we, we kind of drifted, I think, in this conversation a little bit to the immediate policy challenge. But on the other hand, I don't think it needs to kind of uh, go down every route. So for example, on digital currency, the ECB has been consulting. We said we're working on it. Uh, 
but it's very clearly at a very initial stage. And if you like, it's basically orthogonal to the monetary policy, the payment system, and so on. So I think in terms of the, the current strategy review, it's, 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 it's a, uh, you know, um, it should not be confused with the work we're doing on, on digital currency. Uh, there's no particular order on how I'm responding here. It's just a scatter of my notes. Uh, on green, um, I, I think uh, that really, uh, you can categorize it into two levels. One is recognizing the reality of climate change and the reality of the carbon transition. So that, that's a basic issue, and that cuts across everything we do. So whether it's trying to understand the economic development, you know, because there's going to be structural change with the kind of change in the energy sector, uh, structural change everywhere, um, depend on the speed of, of the climate policies that are implemented across the European Union. So, th so that's one dimension. The other dimension, uh, as Reza has indicated, is also a leadership role. You know, do we have a catalytic role as well? And so on both dimensions, we're, we're, we're working on it. So again, uh, over time, we'll come back to that. And again, uh, most of that is really global uh, in issues. I mean, I think we, we uh, it's, it's a tremendously uh, interesting intellectual project to, to go through this review because we are literally, uh, I would say literally, but uh, metaphorically leaving no stone unturned. So, you know, you can be assured that, you know, pretty much every idea that you've been raising here in some committee somewhere across the, and I should emphasize this is a Euro system review. Uh, there's a lot of staff engaged across the Euro system, not just the, the kind of uh, people uh, in Frankfurt. And so there's all sorts of uh, interesting work going on. Let me, and I, I also basically agree, maybe a, a kind of foundation is a retrospective narrative of how we got here. Uh, but I think in, in, we should be realistic that it's at one level totally overdetermined. There's no way you can say it's all structural. There's no way you can say it's all bad forecasting. There's going to be some mix. And if you like, it's really in the interaction. So one of the open questions is, uh, if you had a time machine and went back, and if you had a better understanding five or six years ago, for example, what exactly are the ways that globalization or digitalization and so on what exactly are the ways they influence the economy and the inflation process? Could we have uh, recalibrated our monetary policy to allow for that, i.e. Uh, to, to deliver the inflation goal regardless of what's going on in terms of structural forces? I mean, I, I, mean, I suppose, honestly, that personal view is inflation remains under the control of the central bank. Now, a I, I, I very fundamental issue, which you've all covered more or less, is low equilibrium real rates and the associated implication of spending more time near the lower bounds, wherever the lower bounds might be. And a fundamental issue there is in addition to using uh, other instruments, which is globally standard, using forward guidance, using asset purchases, there's also the issue about uh, the scale of intervention. I mean, obviously the number one uh, result is don't get near the lower bounds. <laughs> You know, if you can stay at two and be aggressive at two to avoid drifting down to lower bounds, life is simple. However, if, if inflation goes down and you go towards the lower bounds, then the, the scale of the monetary policy response to shocks is muted, in, at least in relation to negative shocks. And this is why, again, uh, for the last five or six years, we've always said gradual, patience, persistence. It's not the case in inflation can. And this goes back to the narrative, uh, which I, you know, pre-pandemic, uh, we did have a, a, a kind of gradual but slow, absolutely slow move up in core inflation. So, you know, my, my narrative up to pre-pandemic was absolutely monetary policy was working, but, but it was a gradual process. And again, if, you know, obviously big picture, it's not moving so quickly, but in terms of the ability to get back to, to you know, I, I think it, it, it's there. I mean, I would, uh, let me uh, just see now uh, in the time uh, we have, uh, what else we can get to. The symmetry, I mean, honestly, I mean, we've all been trying to uh, develop, because I mean, obviously one basic issue is symmetry in your preferences. Caring equally about over, you know, so there's a cost to, to high inflation and there's a cost to low inflation. And the process be pretty much, so long as the overshoots are not too big and the undershoots are not too big. 
that you know, I think that the world probably agrees that it should be symmetric. You know, that there's cost on both sides. But I think where the whole science of monetary policy has moved on is that does not mean a symmetric reaction function, because there's a fundamental asymmetry. There's a lower bound. You know, so in other words, there is, there is a lower bound you have to keep an eye on in one direction. There's not an upper bound in how much you can tighten when you need to. And that basic asymmetry has different potential answers. So, you know, again, uh, there's been a, a lot of discussion here about flexible average inflation targeting, which clearly is one clear pathway. The other question, and again, going back to no stone and third is, uh, you know, uh, we have time, let's take a look. I mean, is that the only answer? Are there other answers to that? There's also this issue, as I think Eric mentioned, also being having the balance of escape clauses and uh, other factors, you know, um, and, you know, everyone uh, has to balance the value of the uh, hard commitment versus the, the value of discretion. So, so those are kind of a, a, a classic issues. I mean, an interesting issue, Mary, that you, one of the issues you were, you were raising, of course, is has to do with, with uncertainty, how to deal with robustness. But I would maybe emphasize there is, of course, that's partly why we have a medium term orientation. We're not claiming to deliver precise outcomes. But it's also not clear. Uh, I mean, there's no universal rule. If you do, uh, do less, or if you're uncertain, do you do more? I mean, it, it, it all depends. So it's an interesting, uh, so it sounds like a good idea if we have a robust policy, but what exactly that means is uh, not automatically, automatically obvious. Um, there's an issue about spillovers versus coordination. I mean, we, we all the time say there's a high, we think fiscal multipliers are quite high in this, in this environment. Uh, at the end of the introductory statements, we routinely call for more fiscal action. Um, but so in other words, everyone agrees on that. Uh, I presume uh, those who are running fiscal policy notice what the central bank is doing as well. But the, the question is whether uh, that kind of Nash equilibrium, is, is that enough? Does it require more than that? And we, we have said we're looking at monetary fiscal interactions uh, as part of this, uh, uh, this review. So, you know, I'm, I'm in the uh, fortunate position uh, as of January of we really are in this kind of uh, open area. There's, you know, there's absolutely no signals in what I've told you because it, we're too far away from drawing conclusions. Maybe it's interesting to uh, reflect on that this review started before the pandemic. Now, we did pause. I mean, we were a bit busy. Uh, but it's also the case, uh, what are we learning from the pandemic? What are we learning from the pandemic? Um, and also the state of the world has changed. The initial conditions uh, for, for the next phase of monetary policy uh, are, are different. I, I don't think there should be over concern about exit issues. I mean, we've already done it repeatedly. We've, we've kind of scaled down QE in the past. We stopped net, net purchases at the end of 2018. So, you know, and we're, you know, these things have to be managed. You can't take people by too much by surprise. But, but I personally don't think that that's a big issue. Um, and maybe going back to the narrative, uh, Versky pointed out to, and if you just take a simple Phillips curve, and you know, I wrote a paper from an ECB colleagues a year ago on the Phillips curve at the ECB. I mean, I think it's a very good framework because the intercepts basically reflect expected inter inflation. And I, what I've repeatedly said in, in many fora is to me, uh, you know, it may not be true week by week, but overwhelmingly, uh, there's a very punitive effect, which is uh, expect inflation tracks actual inflation. So if actual inflation is persistently low, there's a drift down in expected inflation. So maybe you can help with, with some, some of the kind of uh, other strategies, but, but that's by far, I think, the most important uh, influence. Um, so, you know, I think uh, the, the kind of uh, a lot of the issue about anchoring expected inflation as a target can only come from actually getting inflation up, you know, so, so I think. Um, and then Slack. So, so the, the issue, Eric, I mean, I think, um, again, it's pretty hard to look beyond Slack as a very good ex explainer. Uh, and we did see it in the mid, like 2017, 2018, where the wage for this curve came back up. When in, and it does not non-linearity. Unemployment has to be low enough. The labor market has to be hot enough for the wage for this curve to kick in. 
Now, the price for the curve, uh, not so much, and this is where the drift down in inflation implications is relevant. Let me mention uh, this issue about demography and all of that, that's global. But what's maybe a very basic difference between Europe and the US is the chronic current account surplus in, the US, in Europe and the chronic current account deficit in the US. Because in terms of uh, pressure, like demand pressures in, in product markets, that's an obvious, uh, you can think about level of demand for non-traded goods and so on. So I've, again, uh, in various features, uh, highlighted that. So I've kind of, uh, I think, fluctuated between uh, strategy issues, the state of the world uh, we're in uh, uh, today. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, you know, it's going to be, you know, there's going to be a lot of synthesizing, a lot of integration uh, to bring all, all of that together uh, in, in, the, in the coming months. Um, distribution. I mean, this is an interesting issue, issue Don Trump. Um, it is... Uh, and maybe my recurring point I have in every conversation about this and related topics is what bit of this is equilibrium real interest rate and what bit is monetary policy. So if the world is basically adjusting to low or star by you know repricing the kind of sustainable debt to income ratio for you know someone trying to buy a house and uh, the kind of fair value of equities versus bonds and so on, that could be a big uh, you know, the market may be getting it wrong, they may be, but, but I do think uh, it, for many topics, we have to ask, is it or star or is it the monetary policy rate? You know, so, I mean, we operate in the chat of or star. And of course, uh, let me remind you, uh, the same type of people uh, who might hold uh, lots of equity in their pension funds are also maybe the same type of people who are not so happy about low interest rates on their uh, bank accounts. You know, so, so um, uh, and you know, I think uh, it's a very interesting issue. But the good news in the day of big big data, we have much more uh, data by cohort. We can look at it, and it's clearly a feedback to monetary policy, given to different marginal potentials to consume at different parts of the distribution. So over and above the political economy, it's a basic macro issue issue as well. Um, and then maybe the other point about productivity and low interest rates. Uh, okay, the, the zombie debate is there, but I mean, low interest rates are usually uh, good for investment, uh, they're usually good for aggregate demand, uh, and we do know uh, financial distress is not good for, for productivity. So, you know, I, again, it's quantitative. Look at all of those. Uh, we see research in various universities and also internal ECB, which is trying to, to use all of these uh, big firm level data sets to get a, a more uh, precise answer. Uh, so, so let me stop there, maybe. Philip, thank you very much for your extensive uh, uh, reply and also for getting quite to the technical details which matter here because that's they, they refer to the transmission, which is very part of the big part of the conversation. Um, I am uh, I apologize, I've already exceeded the time and have kept you back uh, uh, for more than I ever had to. Thank you all very much for participating. I'm sure, Reza, that the uh, the Monetary Policy Strategy Review will not disappoint. So we are all looking forward to uh, okay. we are looking forward to the outcome. In the meantime, thanks very much for coming, Philip, uh, Reza, and Eric. Thank you very much, and of course to my Bruegel fellows. We hope to see you again in one of our 